My parents are living a life I don't want to live at 70. Women are really the pioneers of aging. A woman really needs chocolate. Love older women, younger men. Woman a pause. Yeah. <laughs> women who don't have to pause. We, we are best friends. Minnesota Okinawa. We are the Mountain Women of Jackson Hole. To your health. I have prepared myself to be where I am. Having a purpose is the key. People say I must be special to do this, but I'm not special. I just love. Part of my purpose is to help those little things make a gigantic difference. We all have challenges. None of us get through this lifetime without a hard time. Breast cancer is really a disease related to hormones. It's like the play, you know. My mother wouldn't say the word. Anything that you do to prevent heart disease also prevents cancer and makes you live longer and better. It isn't ever too late. Five girls to simulate what an actual jam would be. I cry, I feel much better afterwards. This is why I do what I do. Our estrogen decreases and it really affects our sex drive. The hormone changes, he ain't got no problems compared to that, I promise you. We're not gonna go back to hunter-gatherer, but we do have to make some changes. America's lifestyle is killing us. Age is just a number. The older a tree gets, the more beautiful it gets. It's not really a male-dominated world. Men just think it is. At the University of Michigan's A. Alfred Taubman Medical Research Institute, we're standing behind women as they embrace all of life to the fullest. New Step Ann Arbor, supporting the active lives of women with inclusive fitness products for over 20 years. The area agencies on aging serving Southeast Michigan are a trusted resource for and a proud supporter of today's aging woman. The change of life. We've all heard that term as it applies to menopause, but our bodies aren't the only things that are impacted. So are our life goals, relationships, and even our self-concept. I'm Desiree Cooper. Join me as we try to understand what's actually happening during this transformational stage in a woman's life. I know that half lashes are miserable. I know they're miserable. I know you want to rip your clothes off half the time, but there are things that you can do and you will get through this. Woman of pause. Yeah. <laughs> Women who don't have to pause. <laughs> when I hit it, through it, my mother was already dead, so I didn't get to ask her how it was, but I never remembered her having difficulty, and so I thought, I can sail through this too. I didn't even notice it. <laughs> I didn't either, Connie. Yeah. It just kind of happened and you went, well, what's the big deal? You have not had a period for one year. Now you're in menopause. This is where I started to realize I have really strong opinions about aging. That's a big line in the sand for many women and I think uh, you know, unless you're totally clairvoyant, um, you're not going to know what it's like for you until you're there. 27 laps in five minutes or else you fail and you go home. I'm not washing my equipment anymore. Hormones are really a woman's friend, but they have to be balanced. Imbalances in hormones are certainly related to why people feel bad. Bladder problems. Your periods become irregular. Anti ramen noodles. Anxiety. You may bleed heavy. Betty Rampage. Irritability. You may not have a period for three months. Foxy peroxide. Insomnia. Vaginal dryness. Catcher in the raw eye. Mood swings. You start having the hot flashes. Booty fall. Depression. Come on, push! Heart racing. Lady bump. I can't relate to that because I didn't experience any of those things. It's not an illness. It's a, it's a process of life. Gradually, hormone levels go, certain hormone levels go down and others go up. As a result of that, Total cholesterol rises a bit, blood pressure rises a bit. Menopause is a physiologic change that causes, uh, that impacts personalities, behaviors, likes, dislikes. Oh, psycho. Bad day at work? No, it's hormones rushing through the blood 
and it's confusing to everyone. When's dinner gonna be ready? Do you think I'm your personal chef? We see people that are just not able to have the energy that they used to have, and they're trying to combat it. Fresh meat! I eat pizza six months, that cheese is still sitting on my ass, you know, and it's not fair. Can you imagine a snarling caged beast trapped inside your body, trying to chew its way out through your nervous system? That's me on a good day. Menopause is a pain in the neck, but you can resolve it. Men need to understand that, um, that their significant other is going through a hormonal change so that she may have some mood swings. And it's important to be understanding of that. The big challenge of relationships is that neither couple understand the sexual changes that women go through when they start going into the menopause. Yes, some women do stay sexually active. There's no question about that. But a lot of women, the mass proportion of women, start to lose their libido or actually completely lose interest in sex. And sudden, this is such a big issue in relationships that's not spoken about. Many, many women come in who say to me, I would much rather go to bed with a book than go to bed with my husband. And it has nothing to do with loving their husbands. It has to do with really there just is no drive. It's hard on him because obviously he still wants to have an active sexual life. But if he, the woman he's married to who's growing older and getting used to the losses of her body and how she feels about her herself and she doesn't want to have sex where does that go if they're not talking to each other remember now men go through menopause as well their testicles start to atrophy they are no longer able to get it up so women need to get an attitude about their treatment they need to find out if they have hormonal imbalances that are creating the problems in their life both men and women have to have normal estrogen progesterone testosterone DHEA and cortisol to be healthy. When women or men are moving into their, you know, pause, which is just sort of a, a period when the hormones begin to drop a bit, uh, they, they use some form of replacement therapy. Against all odds, I decided that I'm going to continue to take a teeny bit of estrogen, because we need it. We lose it and we need it. And, you know, I, I know that uh, I feel the way I feel because of that. The controversy really is uh, related to women using uh, synthetic hormones such as uh, conjugated estrogens and uh, synthetic progestin is what they found is that they suffered from a higher incidence of breast cancer and strokes and some other types of, of events. I like to say it's a really great time for women when they're experiencing these changes anyway to reflect on their health. I love menopause because my hormones are stable every single day. I don't have a 28-day cycle going on anymore, but because I'm taking bioidentical hormones, my hormones are exactly perfect every day of my life. This is fabulous, so that I have vision, memory, and mobility, which are the things that people worry the most about. It was liberating more than being the trauma that society tends to paint it. Before I was 35, I was told I would lose my sex drive. However, I didn't. It was like a, a whole new life. I didn't have to worry as about birth control. I didn't have to, uh, I didn't get my period anymore. Um, I felt really sexy. When it comes to hormones, there's a lot of controversy out there. Women that are going through menopause are going through emotional, spiritual, physical changes because of their hormone changes. And they really are looking for an answer. And the problem is that the answer is not necessarily out there yet. All right? There's bioidentical hormones, there's synthetic hormones, there's all sorts of different pills and, and books on it. But the reality is you need to talk to your doctor to really understand what your risks are in terms of heart disease, in terms of cancer, in terms of clots, and there's a lot of other things out there that you really need to understand before starting some of these therapies. And so it should be a very personalized plan between you and your physician. We're gonna all go through menopause. It is inevitable. And women have been doing it for hundreds of years, thousands of years. This is what happens. Now we live longer through our menopause, so it's, it's a little bit more difficult for us. But the truth is, is we can get through this. And I think it's important to get through it with a sense of humor. I think it's important to 
try and maintain and to be as healthy as you can be. But I think it's also important that you try to understand what your partners are going through. Support each other. That is really the major thing. Because trust me, life after is really, really fun if you, if you do it together. A cancer diagnosis in any form is frightening. But for us, breast cancer and ovarian cancer raise particular concerns that relate to the very nature of womanhood. In this episode, we explore how breast and ovarian cancer affect us as we age. One of the worst days of my life was the day that I was told that I had cancer. I think ovarian cancer is a very frightening diagnosis for women because it starts in something that defines us as women, our ability to have children, our ovaries, our gynecologic organs. I think many women are completely terrified when they hear that they have a cancer that developed in something like this. Ovarian cancer is the eighth most common, but is the most deadly gynecologic malignancy that women can be afflicted with. Generally, when we're talking about ovarian cancer, people are going to focus on epithelial ovarian cancer. This is the one that your mother, your sister, these are the ones they die of. The ovarian cancer will start um, in the cells of the ovary, specifically the epithelial cells. It'll be on the inside of the ovary, but will eventually grow, and it will often burst out of the surface of the ovary and then begin to spread. And so generally, when we see a patient with ovarian cancer, it's very rare to just see cancer in that ovary. We've come a long, long way in terms of cancer treatment and cancer detection, which really is the key. The, the pap smears have decreased the risk of cervical cancer. We now have the vaccines for the young women. Women should go and have their annual gynecologic exam every year. That's why it's annual. Um, have a pelvic exam, have an abdominal exam, and make sure to report any symptom. Now, ovarian cancer is often erroneously called the silent killer because there may not be an obvious symptom that is clearly associated with ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is the one I think that we all fear the most because it's so difficult to diagnose. Five things a woman should know about ovarian cancer. One is that, that it's the fifth most common cancer among women, that it is the most deadly cancer among women. One in 70 women can develop this disease. We certainly know there are specific risk factors that can put you, um, give you a higher chance of developing ovarian cancer. And the number one is age, just your cells getting older. There's more of a chance to develop those abnormal cells that will go on to become cancer. It does seem that the later that a patient undergoes menopause, the higher risk that they have of developing ovarian cancer. And there are lifestyle, um, behaviors that may are, are cause cancer development, such as smoking, obesity, uh, excessive alcohol consumption, uh, also lack of exercise, a sedentary lifestyle. Other risk factors include um, prolonged exposure to ovulation. Only 10% of women with ovarian cancer will have a genetic risk um, for ovarian cancer with a BRCA gene. Women that have the BRCA gene or that are known to have the BRCA gene should be involved with a genetic counselor right away and let their gynecologist know because there are screening tests that have been shown to potentially reduce the risk of development of ovarian cancer. If you're having symptoms that are persistent and seem nondescript, abdominal pain, pelvic pain, nausea, vomiting, losing weight, abdominal bloating, or reflux. Those things could be related to many diagnoses, but it could be related to ovarian cancer. If they find something abnormal, you, you want to tell somebody. You, wanna, you don't want to let things sit for any length of time. My son was getting married and I was being fitted for my dress for the wedding and I realized I actually had to have my dress altered because it no longer fit because of the bloating. And so my doctor attributed this to postmenopausal weight gain. This happens so often, so frequently with the medical community because they just simply don't understand the signs and symptoms. When the doctor opened me to do a laparoscopic surgery to, on the colon, he immediately found a mass on my pelvic wall about the size of a tennis ball. There is no test for ovarian cancer. If they're fortunate, Women find this disease in an incidental way. This was their third annual Mioka Turn the Village Teal. We had 
almost 200 walker, walkers and runners in the event. I'm here with my beautiful family and we're having an awesome time for a wonderful cause. So many of the women behind us are either newly diagnosed or they know someone who has ovarian cancer or they have lost someone with ovarian cancer, but there is hope. We are all survivors! But the biggest hope that can come with this disease is if we can get an early detection tool, a better early detection tool. Right now, the only one really is this blood test called the CA-125, and it's not a perfect test, and doctors don't regularly recommend it to women. It's the only test out there, but there has to be better early detection. It's Diane Labar, my wife, Dana's mother. She had been well for the most part, and uh, this just kind of came upon what was kind of fulminant, kind of overnight. And she had a very stormy course. Walking Walk for Team Diane. Breast cancer has pink, heart disease is red, but ovarian cancer now, it's teal. If you see teal, think ovarian cancer. Think awareness. We can change women's lives. Ready, set, teal. <laughs> It can be very stressful to be coming in every week for chemotherapy. And so doing things like exercise, meditation, and relaxation techniques can really help a patient get through all of that additional treatment. You know, the most important, my patients always ask me, what's the most important thing I can do? And I tell them, show up. Show up for treatment. Get every treatment we ask you to get. But if you do all of these great lifestyle things, you're more likely to show up and you're most, more likely to tolerate it well. And so I think that's one of the biggest impacts that a healthy lifestyle can have on a patient with cancer. Our body has um, the ability to reproduce a number of cells and we do this every day. In the case of breast cancer, you know, breast cells are often proliferating. So every time a cell divides, it has the potential to make a mistake in its genetic coding. And those independently growing unregulated cells that came from our own body, those, those are cancers. They are walking in honor of a loved one, in memory of, love, of a loved one. The diagnosis of any cancer is devastating. My mother died from breast cancer. It is so scary. It's unbearable. It's, it's like the plague, you know, in the old days. I thought I just had a shadow on my mammogram, so I didn't even know I was there. Breast cancer is the best thing that has ever happened to me. I'm really concerned that my hair isn't falling out. Maybe the ke chemicals are not working. They get the news, they accept the news, and they move forward. I'm here for the chicks and all their boobs. <laughs> I lost my bride, Martha, last summer. She put up a fight like nobody ever you saw. I had to fight like she fought. I signed up for one and then I thought, let's really go for it and they had 14 cities that they were doing these walks in and I signed up for all 14. Feels really good. Just want to finish, get in there and and say hello to my bride as I go across that finish line. When a woman is diagnosed with an illness like cancer, it's frightening, it's overwhelming, it's even stressful. But it's so wonderful as a therapist, psychologist and relationship expert to see her man be there for her during the journey that she's about to take. And in fact, what happens to that relationship is that it changes dramatically, especially in terms of intimacy. You're at home, you're having the bandages removed by the uh, visiting nurse and to just Come, come to grips or deal with your own body, that it's different. I probably have a very high pain tolerance, so I don't, um, unless, it's, unless it's in my mouth or my jaw, <laughs> I just accept it. You know, I'm getting old, so the thought of anything happening to me just was exceedingly remote. I was gonna be okay. I was going to be old and demented like my mother was. It's, uh, it's certainly 
it's scary in some ways and it's certainly unexpected, but you, you have to deal with it. I'm really fortunate. My husband, Cliff, wants to be an integral part of this whole process. And that's how we've kind of faced everything that we've done together. Uh, we've done it as a team, as a partnership. Hey. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Hello, Doctor. How was vacation? It was nice to be in a, up at Camp Michigan yeah. with the family. Yeah. Um, enjoyed it a lot. Nice good. to get away. So do you feel any different today that you had an extra week off? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I, it's that when I was up, I think that issue of the acne or the skin changes, I mean, and only on my right cheek versus my left, my left. Very nice, <laughs> very nice. Very nice. <laughs> um, came, and where maybe after the first treatment, mm -hmm. I had noticed that. Okay. And then it went away. Right. Came back. Came back. Okay. No nausea this time? No. Okay. Any problem with your, your shot, your new last of shots causing bone pain or anything? Okay. Um, and uh, you have some Norco on here. Are you taking that for pain now? Oh, that's, no, I wouldn't no. do that. Just ibuprofen. Okay. Ibuprofen. Yeah, I don't want to do anything else if I don't have to. Dr. Schott is good. She's willing to go that extra mile and attend to other physical needs like ears and noses. <laughs> I'm all checked in and now we wait for our turn. Breast cancer in particular is related to hormone exposure. As a woman ages, her body has had longer and longer periods of time to accumulate these genetic mistakes and accidents. Um, and so the incidence of cancer by and large increases as people get older. They want you to have be hydrated. I should probably be drinking more water, but get it in here. I am ready. This first round of treatment they refer to as AC, and uh, you are given two uh, different chemicals. One is infused, and the other is quote unquote pushed. This will be the fourth treatment of the AC. And then we'll do Taxol. I'm fortunate to have a really good doctor who makes certain, or made certain, that we scheduled appointments very regularly every year. So I showed up at his office uh, thinking that it would, in February, thinking that it would be another one of the regular routine visits. The usual sign of breast cancer is a breast lump. Typically these are painless. Um, some women, especially younger women, will have painful lumps in their breasts. These might be associated with menstruation and be cysts. If you feel a lump under your arm, that might be something that would also be a, of concern for development of breast cancer. In doing um, an, an examination of the breasts, he got very quiet and he suggested I get my mammogram. I've been going to the same radiologist for maybe almost 20 years, so I saw her towards the end of March. For diagnosis of breast cancer, we have screening programs. So screening programs are really set up to diagnose asymptomatic breast cancer, in other words, before you can feel a lump. After an abnormality is found on mammography, often a series of tests are recommended. Said yes, there is an issue, Ingrid, and I need you to have a biopsy done. The needle biopsy is really the way that we diagnose breast cancer after we found an abnormality. I had the appointment for the biopsy here at the University of Michigan and by that following Thursday I knew I had pretty aggressive breast cancer and my surgery was scheduled for April 13th. In our upcoming third episode, we'll continue on the personal journey with Ingrid Sheldon as she endures chemo and radiation treatments. I'm Desiree Cooper. See you next week.
at the University of Michigan's A. Alfred Taubman Medical Research Institute, we're standing behind women as they embrace all of life to the fullest.